Hey everybody and welcome to another Wheel of Time video. I wanted to kick this video off uh, just by thanking everybody. Uh, we hit some milestones on the channel here recently and it's just exciting to know that there's such a large crowd out there that wants to talk and discuss the Wheel of Time. Even other YouTube creators are, are seeing a bump in their viewership and it's just exciting to see where the community's headed. So I just wanted to throw that out there to all of you. Obviously this is one of my favorite pieces of fiction so this is just a lot of fun to do. If you are craving more Wheel of Time content and you enjoy my videos, please consider subscribing to the channel and, and certainly give me some feedbacks down in the comments. I try to read every comment, um, but uh, anyways, let's go ahead and get into the video. So Easter eggs are something that have become fairly normal in today's movies and television series. We see Easter eggs dropped in Marvel movies, for instance, either paying homage to the comic books or giving hints to future plot lines. And today we're gonna be taking a look at some of the cool Easter eggs that Robert Jordan has dropped in the novels that are kind of fun to sniff out. Let's go ahead and start by throwing up a spoiler warning. We are going to give this video a spoiler warning of yellow. There will be minor spoilers, but really just names and references. Uh, nothing major about the plot is going to be given away. With that out of the way, let's get some background before we get into our list. The main premise behind the Wheel of Time is that world history is a cycle and that the past is really also the future as the Wheel of Time spins. In fact, the opening line of the books explains this well. The wheel of time turns, the ages come and pass, leaving memories that become legend. Legend fades to myth, and even myth is long forgotten when the age that gave it birth comes again. There are seven ages in the wheel of time, and the events of the book take place at the end of the third age. The second age is known as the Age of Legends, ending with the Patch on the Dark One's prison and the breaking of the world. It is widely believed that the first age is the age in which our time resides, but that can just really be speculated. Regardless of when our age sits on the Wheel of Time, there are numerous references within the books to people, events, and items from our time. In this video, we're going to take a look at 10 Easter eggs to our age from the Wheel of Time novels. These are not in any particular order, so there's not going to be a ranking system, so we're just going to go ahead and dive right on into our list. In Chapter 4 of The Eye of the World, we find Tom Marilyn meeting our main characters. They are overawed at the presence of a gleeman in the two rivers. As they beg him to tell them stories, he starts to list off the many tales of which he could perform. A couple of the real-world references from our list come from this excerpt from Tom, and the first mention is the Thousand Tales of Anla, the Wise Counselor. There is another reference in Chapter 20 of The Shadow Rising. Tom ponders if Anla was really the sister of Elsbeth and Anla was actually a wise counselor, or was she something else? This could be a reference to Anne Landers, the famous advice columnist for the Chicago Sun-Times, from the 1940s all the way up to July of 2002. Anla being someone else is a reference to Ann Landers being the pen name for Epi Letterer, who was actually the third person to take over the column, but she's the one that made it famous. The Ann Landers column ran in syndication around the country, giving out advice from experts in the guise of a woman named Ann Landers. The column ended in July of 2002 after the death of Epi Letterer. Epi Letterer's sister was the person behind the Dear Abby column that was also similar to this, so this could be the source of the mention that was Anla really the sister of Elsbeth? Apparently the letters of Anne Landers were passed down through history and eventually turned into a Gleeman's tale, though Tom wonders if this is actually the way that events unfolded due to the changes that come with history. Another excerpt from Chapter 4 of The Eye of the World is in the same conversation with Tom Marilyn and our main characters. Egwene asks him to tell the tale of Len and how he flew to the moon in the belly of an eagle made of fire. This is more than likely a reference to American astronaut John Glenn, who was the first American to orbit the Earth. After retiring from NASA, Glenn went on to become a Democratic senator from Ohio from 1974 to 1999. In 1998, while still a senator, John Glenn flew the space shuttle, becoming the oldest man to ever go to space. John Glenn served the United States until his death in 2016 at the age of 95. The reference to flying to the moon in the belly of an eagle made of fire is a reference to the first moon landing in 1969 by NASA. The landing vehicle that Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin took to the lunar surface was called the Eagle. It's in, uh, Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed. 
Roger, Twain. It is possible that this is a merging of two historical events that occurred in near time to each other. This is an example of memories fading to legend and legend fading to myth. Right after Egwene asks Tom to tell the story of Len, she also asks to hear the story about his daughter Salia walking among the stars. This is most likely a reference to Sally Ride, the first American woman to go to space in 1983. Sally Ride was the third person in space overall and was a very famous and influential part of the American space program. She was also part of the investigative team that investigated the Challenger shuttle explosion, having previously been a crew member on the Challenger. Sally Ride passed away from pancreatic cancer in 2012. <laughs> Also in Chapter 4 of The Eye of the World, Tom mentions the tales of Mosk the Giant with his lance of fire that could reach around the world. Later in Chapter 20 of The Shadow Rising, Tom muses to Elaine, wondering, did Mosk and Merc really fight with spears of fire? And were they really giants? This could refer to the conflict between the United States of America and her allies and the Soviet Union from the end of World War II up until 1991. Mosk the Giant is a reference to Moscow, and Merc is to America. The lances of fire are references to ICBMs. During this time, neither country nor their allies were engaged in all-out war, but fought economically and politically for influence and control of other countries around the world. And the threat of nuclear war between the two powers was always on the horizon. Another of the Chapter 4 nuggets from Tom Marilyn is the mention of Elsbeth, Queen of All. Later in Chapter 20 of The Shadow Rising, he again wonders, if Elsbeth was really the queen of the whole world. This could either be a reference to Queen Elizabeth I, who ruled England from November 17th of 1558 until March 24th of 1603, or it could be for Queen Elizabeth II, who is currently the queen of the United Kingdom. The trouble with this being a reference to Queen Elizabeth I is that her rule did not extend much off of the English Isle, as England did not have much of an empire at that point. And Queen Elizabeth II rules over the Commonwealth, but is really not the empire that it once was, and she really doesn't have any real power. This could be another combination of references, as the reign of Queen Victoria, for example, could be historically attributed to the very popular Queen Elizabeth. Queen Victoria ruled over an empire on which the sun never set, and at its height ruled over 25% of the landmass of the world and 23% of the world's population. Robert Jordan is very fond of demonstrating the way history can be changed over time, and after cataclysmic events change records, it essentially becomes a historical game of telephone. Chapter 4 of The Eye of the World gives us one more reference to our time. Tom Marilyn mentions the stories of Ma Therese the Healer. This is most likely a reference to Mother Teresa, the famed Catholic nun who fed, clothed, and housed the poor in India throughout most of her life until her death in 1997. She was born in the Ottoman Empire in 1910 and eventually moved to India where she founded the Missionaries of Charity, her religious congregation committed to serving and helping the poor. She was the winner of the Nobel Prize in 1979 and was recognized as a saint by the Catholic Church after her death. It is clear how history could remember the many good works of Mother Teresa and how she could become known as the healer. In chapter 11 of The Shadow Rising, we get a glimpse of a number of the items in the Panarch's palace. One of these items is a small piece of metal shaped in a circular fashion with three prongs. This is very clearly a reference to the Mercedes-Benz logo. Apparently a piece fell off of a car and lasted through the Age of Legends and a number of ages to become an artifact in the Third Age. German cars are clearly better. Also in the Panarch's palace, we see the skeletal remains of a couple animals. Clearly these animals were either extinct or not native to the Westlands, as the bones are very foreign to Egwene. She sees a large skull that looks larger than anything that she's ever seen, and it appears to have four eye sockets. But at a closer look, she discovers that two of the eye sockets were really areas where tusks were located. She also sees the bones of an animal with a very long neck. This is a reference to an elephant and a giraffe. Now, Egwene had not seen much of the world at this point, but the signs in front of the bones stated that they were from a time before the Age of Legends, leading us to believe that those bones were of extinct animals, and most likely, an elephant and giraffe. In the Shadow Rising, while visiting the city of Roideon, Rand and Matt come across the Avonsdora tree, 
and Rand recalls the story of Gotam sitting underneath the tree for 40 years to gain wisdom. Rand notes that he could certainly see somebody doing this after the feeling of peace that comes from being near the tree of life. This is almost certainly a reference to Gautama Buddha and the story of him sitting underneath the Bodhi tree for 49 days until he gained enlightenment. It is said at this time he became fully awakened and became the Buddha. Buddha's life and teachings became the basis for the Buddhist religion and way of life, starting one of the most prominent religions of our time and certainly something that would be remembered in myth and legend. In the last chapter of The Great Hunt, Loyal is reading a book called To Sail Beyond the Sunset. It is mentioned casually, but this book Loyal is reading could have two separate references. First of all, it is a line from the famous poem Ulysses by Lord Alfred Tennyson. The line comes from the last part of the poem where Ulysses is pondering about going on new adventures. This could also be a reference to the science fiction novel by the same name. To Sail Beyond the Sunset by Robert Heinlein. It's a science fiction novel about an extremely long-lived family of incestuous people. It's a very strange book. So there you have it, our list of 10 real-world references within the story of The Wheel of Time. Are there any that I missed? What about any, a different interpretation of any of these? If so, please make sure to leave me a note down in the comments below. Also, I have already recently recorded part two of our series on the new Wheel of Time show and what we can expect. So if you haven't checked out the first in the series, make sure you do that before the next one releases here uh, in the next day or two. Uh, there will be a box next to my head somewhere at the end of this video where you can kind of click to see some of my other Wheel of Time videos. And as always, if you are liking my Wheel of Time content, please like the video and make sure to subscribe to the channel and get updates when new videos release. You can click the bell icon to be notified when I post new videos. Hey guys, thanks again and until next time, peace out. Tinker in the kitchen with a job of work to do Mistress up above, slipping on a rope of blue She prances down the staircase, a fancy oh so free Crying, Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me?